Museum and the Farmers Museum. I'm Paul D'Ambrosio, the president and CEO of both museums, and I want you to know that we are able to do what we do at these two great museums uh, because of people like you who support us and participate in our many programs and activities. It really means a lot. We owe a great deal to your enthusiasm, your feedback, your presence here at the museum. So thank you for being members and for counting us among the important things in your lives. I really appreciate that. And I also want to thank our membership manager, Kate Morgan, who coordinated the entire day's event. We're very proud that our membership program has been enhanced by offering numerous opportunities for members to experience more here in Cooperstown. Programs and events are going strong this year, as you can see, if you've enjoyed our exhibitions and programs this summer. Uh, we have a lot for you to pick from. Our summer main stage production in the Lucy B. Hamilton Amphitheater is William Shakespeare's The Tempest. And a uh, uh, sad and poignant note about the Lucy B. Hamilton Amphitheater, Lucy B. Hamilton, known to us and to many affectionately as Bunny, passed away recently, and we do mourn her passing, but we're very proud to carry on her legacy at the amphitheater, which was named for her in 2015. Anyway, so that amphitheater is alive and well and showing uh, The Tempest this summer. We've also got a 19th century comedy called Cox and Box being performed by our Templeton players on the Bump Tavern Green. We're back with Food for Thought programs and Family Farm Fun, and those have been packed. We have a wide range of programming as well for uh, the MC Escher exhibition and others. And coming up in August, we have a record number of artists participating in our annual Art by the Lake event on August 12th, and are very much looking forward to the Farmers Museum's beloved autumn events, Harvest Festival and Tractor Fest. I do have one bit of news. Uh, for the first time in the Cardiff Giants' 76-year residency at the Farmers Museum, um, he is going out on loan to another museum. I know. The Giant will leave us on August 22 for a five-month stint at the Bruce Museum in Greenwich, Connecticut as part of the exhibition, Monsters and Mermaids, Unraveling History's Greatest Hoaxes. As the ex exhibition closes on February 11th of 2024, and I don't know if you can trust an exhibition on hoaxes to close on time, but it's supposed to close on February 11th, and that means the giant will be back in time for sugaring off Sundays in March. And he'll be with us, not that he's going to eat all the pancakes. He'll, he'll be fine. He'll be here for the foreseeable future thereafter. Unless the trip gives him an insatiable wanderlust that we can't contain. But we think, being made of stone, we're pretty safe that he's going to stay put. In terms of exhibitions, it's been a great year so far. We're featuring Crafting Freedom, The Life and Legacy of Free Black Potter Thomas Kamarong. Day tonight, the photographs of Stephen Wilkes and M.C. Escher at Infinite Variations, uh, among others. Um, today is dedicated to the photography of Randy Johnson, as seen in his beautiful exhibition, Storytelling with Photographs, on view in the lower level of the Fenimore Art Museum. Randy's photographs, which chronicle several trips to Africa, have been called stunning brilliant and captivating by viewers this year, and have been lauded by world-renowned photographers Mark Hom and Stephen Wilkes. This should come as no surprise since Randy has been passionate about photography since his youth. You can sense his passion here in this photograph when he first arrived here in March. Uh, he studied photo photojournalism at the University of Southern California in the early 1980s before being drafted into Major League Baseball. After making history for two decades in the Major Leagues, Randy retired in 2010 and returned to photography. In his successful second career, he has captured African safaris, rock concerts, unique travel destinations, and more. His work has been featured 
featured in publications such as Rolling Stone, Spin, and Metal Hammer, and featured in tour programs, posters, books, and websites. And I'm proud to say this year we are celebrating his first ever museum exhibition. Can you tell it's his first ever museum exhibition? Yes. You can bet. You can bet there'll be more to come, and I'll always be proud to say uh, we had it here first. For today's keynote, Randy will take us through his broader body of work, including not only African scenes, but also his travel and concert photography. Despite his baseball reputation as an extremely stoic and intimidating persona, Randy's actually the nicest guy you will ever meet, uh, and, and he's a great storyteller. Would you please welcome, please join me in welcoming Baseball Hall of Famer and outstanding photographer, Randy Johnson. some of my earliest photographs that I, fortunately, I still have, not many, 
but some from college, some early from when I was early in my career in Seattle using a uh, medium format camera, a Pentax 6-7 film camera. And I guess the one thing I kick myself a lot is that I don't have a lot of the negatives in film from my high school days to my college days. Uh, for whatever reason, a damage, misplaced, thrown away, not thinking that I would ever use them for anything down the road. Uh, so I kick myself a lot because if for no other reason to not to have anybody else see them or display them, I would like to recall what I took back then uh, and, and get a laugh probably. But I think we'll uh, start the slideshow and I'll just kind of give you a brief outline on some of my travel where I've, where I've traveled to and some of my favorite destinations and what I'm looking for and taking a picture, but more importantly, you can take five pictures and I'll look at all five and I'm a little bit critical just like I am when I'm throwing a pitch. You know, you take a picture of, of the same subject but five different ways and I want to get that picture and I want someone to look at it and see the same things that I see and it could be possibly the way I took the picture, it could be the edit that I did to the picture, you know, it could start off in color and I, I, I turned it into a black and white picture, which makes it a little bit more timeless looking, uh, various things like that. So, uh, I think when you're a pitcher, and I started pitching when I was seven years old and I retired when I was 46, you got to be pretty creative, you know, you got to understand that your livelihood later in life is getting really good hitters out on a consistent basis because you're trying to keep them at bay and have your team win a game. And so um, let's start the slideshow. And so I, I think most of you know that in 2001, as I was with the Arizona Diamondbacks and we had spring training down in Tucson, Arizona. I was pitching a spring training game and there was a small little camp corner out in center field. And it was for the use of pitchers, our pitchers, and for the use of our hitters so they could go in and later look at their at-bats, their swings, and I could look at my pitching delivery and things like that. So that's pretty standard uh, in today's game. But, you know, 20 plus years ago, it was kind of innovative for technology back then. But the only reason anybody ever saw me hit a bird was is because it was caught on camera, on video. Uh, and so, lucky me, uh, you know, I've pitched 22 years and I've pitched some pretty good games, but most people will come up and say, oh, you're the person that hit the bird. So, um, after I retired and I started getting, diving back into photography and, and, and taking trips and, and, uh, opening up my mind to photography where it's at now compared to where it was when I kind of had things in for a while. I started where I was at with film and now it's digital and there's a, it's come a long way so it took me a while to kind of get up to speed and um, I created a website over time and the webmaster thought, well, what do you want to use for a logo? And I go, I don't know, a, a baseball maybe or something like that. <laughs> Later, later that day, he came back with, uh, you know, a dead bird. And I thought, well, okay, that's, that's pretty creative. Everybody will kind of catch on to that. So that's how that kind of came about. It was a very creative webmaster that came up with the, uh, with the logo. And a lot of people, uh, you know, will reach out to me through my social media and, and make a comment and, uh, and think uh, that's pretty funny. So uh, I guess I'm a pretty funny person. <laughs> Um, so, living in Arizona, there's a lot of great locations to travel to, whether it's Sedona, whether it's Monument Valley, whether it's, you know, the Grand Canyon, um, and just, uh, it's endless, and it's my backyard, and so, in having the time and the ability to travel now, I really 
get on social media a lot of times because I'll see other photographers, what they're taking pictures of, where they're traveling, and then I, I don't have a problem reaching out to them. I may not know them, but I start a dialogue with them and say, yeah, I really enjoy your photography, and, and uh, you know, what, what time of the year did you go to this? And so Arizona is a big favorite spot of mine to travel to, and it's in my backyard, I consider it. And so this was a picture that I took. This is a... Uh, you know, uh, Pentax 67, it's a medium format camera, it's film, so I still shoot film, a lot of people ask that, uh, there's still a few places that you can, can uh, shoot film and then get uh, developed, and you know, a lot of people say that, uh, well, you can just add grain to your picture, and you can still shoot digital and just add, you know, black and white and add some grain, and but there's truly, what I've come to realize in looking at a lot of photography, from Ansel Adams to Jim Marshall, who's a famous uh, 60s rock photographer from the psychedelic era, uh, looking at their work being black and white, you can't recreate that. That's film, and you just kind of know that's film just by the way uh, the density of the picture and the, uh, the black and the white and the shadowing and the grain, and it's just, uh, you might be able to recreate it if you're really good in Photoshop, but I really just enjoyed that, um, and so I, I do shoot a lot of uh, black and white film. So, in, a, in an opportunity like this, and I call these this kind of travel stagnant. And what I mean by that is it's not moving. I can just sit there and take my time. Whereas I traveled to Africa five times, and you can't predict anything there. You got to be on guard all the time. You have to anticipate, and then nothing happens. Uh, but here. You know, those are called mittens, the big, the big mountains. Uh, there's three mittens there. And so I can just sit there all day and take different angles and take a nap and come back and they're still there. And so, you know, taking stagnant pictures are a lot of fun because then I get super creative. You know, I'm um, looking at all different angles and, and uh, things in the foreground and the background. Um, but this was, uh, this is something that I like to go to maybe once a year, every other year. And uh, I hire a local native uh, a guide there, and I get in the back country where, unless you have a uh, local guide, you won't see those uh, areas back there. And it's uh, really interesting to see things that you didn't even know existed whether it's wild horses roaming back there or just sand dunes that you wouldn't normally see. And, you know, back there it's right at sunrise and, and it just takes on a whole new meaning. And when you're walking around with the camera, you know, sometimes you get caught up in just seeing this and, and enjoying it, you know. And a lot of photographers that, that I admire in different fields, whether it's music or whether it's sports or whether it's landscape, a lot of them tell me sometimes you just got to put your camera down and enjoy the moment too because the moment will be gone. Yes, you'll capture it, but you won't always capture it the way you would remember it. Uh, and so uh, I, I've realized that a lot of times where, you know, uh, I'm in a great uh, opportunity and I just got to put my camera down and just enjoy being in the moment where I'm at and uh, because moments you know, like this uh, – the beauty of it, you know, you can't recreate that. It's different all the time. And so I've been very fortunate to do a lot of traveling. But, but Arizona is a place, a hub to me, that I really try to travel to more now. So, yeah. so diving into uh, some of my earliest photography, uh, this was probably in 1982, 1983. Uh, I was just at USC. Uh, getting ready to start my my college baseball career and uh, a higher education and uh, and get into photography and so it wasn't unheard of for me to walk around with the camera and uh, you know there was no cell phones back to remember that so you know the, the best camera is the camera that you have on you which is always our cell phone so I now take lots of photographs with my my cell phone. But back then, I would just walk around with a little 35-millimeter camera because I was a fine art 
major studying photojournalism and never knew what I would run into or find. So one day when I was over on fraternity and sorority row, I was walking down a back alley. Why, I have no idea, but it was on a weekend, and this might have been the outcome of some fraternity kids that had a little bit too much to drink, and someone's car got valet parked in a dumpster. So, uh, as I said earlier, a lot of my negatives and slides have been misplaced. After college, I lived with my parents, and I would go train uh, wherever I could to prepare myself for the next baseball season. So all my, most of my, my belongings were down underneath the house where my parents lived. And over the years, eventually, you know, I, you know, got my feet under me, and I would get my own place. But a lot of my things that I didn't really want to move, I would just leave there. And eventually, I went through a lot of negatives and slides from high school and college, and I just, I, I don't know what I was thinking, but a lot of times I just thought, well, I will never need those things again. I didn't foresee the future being you can, you know, recreate the negative or a slide and scan it and put it on a CD in, in the two, you know, 2020s now and then recreate and make the image better. Well, I didn't see that future. I was only thinking baseball at the time. So, but anyways, I do have a few of the negatives in a few of the slides. Uh, and this is, just so happens to be one of the, uh, one of the negatives that, uh, that I still have. And I actually blew that photograph up to about 20 to 30 to remind me where I've come from. And it's one of the first photographs that I actually thought, well, it's kind of an interesting photograph. I captured something. And, and, uh, and more importantly, it's still around, you know, that I still have the negative. So there's a lot to be said for having something, you know, 40 something years later. Uh, but it's one of my favorite photographs. I took, there's not a lot to it. I never understood what it means, eat tuna. I don't know what that means. I don't know how the car got in the dumpster. I suppose that lends to the person looking at the photograph to assume whatever they would like. So, uh, but it was one of my earliest photographs, and I think it was pretty funny to take the picture. This is one of, one of my later photographs, and I think at that time I, I was no longer in college. I had a few years under, uh, you know, that last picture was from college, uh, and then after I graduated from college uh, in 85, I went and played minor league baseball for, for four years. So we're talking, you know, this photograph was probably seven or eight years later. So my composition, my eye, my camera gear, my willingness, and all of that had changed for the better. And you can see the composition is a little bit different. And uh, this is taken in Seattle at the Pike Place Market area. And if anybody watched the game, the, uh, the festivities were down in the Pike Place Market area. And that uh, they ran a lot of commercials back in the day there where they would throw the big salmon and people would catch it. And, well... If you walk right around this paper stand, that's where the fish stand is. And so when I go back to Seattle, still occasionally, the newspaper stand is gone, but the buildings in the background are still there. And it's one of my favorite pictures because I think if it can withstand the time and you still have it around 40 years later, there's something to be said for that. And it was one of those pictures that I was able to scan get in a CD form and recreate and, and, and make the picture pop a little bit more, if you will. But I thought it was, you know, the picture that I have on my wall, uh, it's one of the featured pieces in my house. Uh, I have a really nice ornate frame around it, and uh, but I just thought this was with the Pentix 6.7, and it shows a slow shutter speed. And the, the one thing that I thought was really cool about the picture when I came back and looked at it years later, you know, you just kind of take a quick glance at some of the images that you have when you take them. But years later, you know, when it's blown up, you, you look at this, this, this gentleman walking with the hat and the black trench coat, and it was just kind of ominous. And it was a timeless picture because it was taken in black and white film. I didn't, I didn't start with color and turn it into black and white. I just thought it. It's one of my favorite pictures for my own reasons. If, if 
for nothing else. Um, so the picture of the, uh, the Mini Cooper in the back dumpster in, in this picture have, you know, kind of survived, if you will, for 40 years over my travels, and uh, I've documented them. They're in my house, and uh, it's kind of a, a starting point, and I'm always reminded from the periods of college where I took the dumpster picture. My earliest photographs when I was with uh, early in my major league career to some of the pictures that I take now that we'll see uh, through my Instagram that Paul was nice enough to make out of a slideshow. So, next. This is one of the pictures that I'm talking about up in uh, Monument Valley. And there's the three mittens that, that I was told that they were called right here, right here, and right here. And uh, that area was used a lot for the John Wayne movies back in the late 60s and late, uh, early 70s. Uh, but the composition there, and I've always felt like, you know, there's so many parallels, at least I make them parallels, when, when I'm shooting photography and when I'm pitching baseball, I tend to uh, analyze things a lot. Uh, when I was pitching someone's, someone's swing, how they how they were setting up to face me, if they made adjustments, if I was watching their adjustments, like if I threw a fastball in, did they back off the plate or did they just stay right where they were? If I threw a pitch away, could they reach that pitch? Do I stay out there? They're making adjustments. I'm making adjustments. And I just thought that, uh, you know, the parallel here is, you know, in a stagnant pitch, like I call it, nothing's moving there. I can just stay and, and take different angles, and I can find the angle that I want. But I, I can't go back there, so I'm not afraid to take 20 pictures, you know, and just kind of sweep around the whole thing. But I thought, uh, you know, the old dead tree there just lent something to the to the picture. And, and more importantly, I think through my eyes anyways, as a photographer, I think a lot of times you look at a picture and it, it looks really good color, in color. And then I think there's other photographs that are timeless because they're black and white. And I think nature, a lot of times, is great in color. And I think something like this in my house, it just shows so great in black and white. So, it's one of my favorite, favorite areas to go and uh, photograph. If you haven't been up to Monument Valley, you should go at some point in your life. So with a lot of travel destinations, I, I've been very fortunate and blessed to have been able to uh, travel as much as I have. And a lot of times, especially now in my travels, I always bring a camera. Uh, may not be the main focus uh, of why I'm going to a particular destination. I may just want to go there because I love the destination, but I always bring my camera. And then on the other hand, there is destinations that I'm going to because I know that it will lend for great opportunities and take some incredible photographs to share with people. And essentially, I'm putting photographs up in my house for me and for people that come into my house to see, but I'm also putting up pictures on my website and my social media to share with people that follow me. So if they've never been there before or if they're considering going there, this is an opportunity for them to see that too. A lot of people haven't been to Africa, and, and some people have reached out to me after they've seen my exhibit and say, we're really thinking about going to Africa now because you have lent us to see something that maybe we didn't know how beautiful it could be, and with all you ever see is the animals, or you just think animals all the time when you're in Africa, but, there, but there's so much more than just animals there, and so um, this was in uh, this was in Vietnam, and so uh, and, uh, I was walking through a small little village, and uh, with my camera just walking down uh, a street, and I uh, the street was open to a lot of houses and things like that, and so I didn't want to take it upon myself to feel like I could just snap photographs. And so every time I saw something that was interesting, I asked in kind of the sign language, you know, that they may understand, can I take your picture and, and say yes or no? And 
I was never denied, but I think it's always important to to ask because uh, it could be perceived as being, you know, uh, kind of intrusive if you were. I mean, kids are playing there or taking a picture of someone eating dinner or whatever, but uh, this was one of the pictures that I just thought was cool because you could see the little girl with the peace sign and then her little sister was right behind her hiding, uh, being bashful, but you can see her fingers coming up over her uh, sisters. And so, once again, it would have been, I really enjoy black and white. Uh, and just, there's something about it, uh, taking pictures in black and white, it just uh, lends to uh, making something look timeless. And uh, I use that word a lot because uh, this could be any, because this could be five years ago when I took it. It could be, you know, 40 years ago. You don't know. Uh, but it's, it was a fun destination. This was, uh, this was in Vietnam as well. And I was on, uh, on my way to a certain destination. And I was in a van with my camera gear and a translator and a driver. And they were harvesting the rice fields. And so that's primarily where I, why I was in that area, because I knew they were harvesting rice fields, and I've seen other photographers uh, with, with their photographs, and I wanted to try to recreate my own through my own eyes, and so I had the van stop, and you could see off into the distance people were harvesting rice fields, and some people would be uh, taking a break. And so I just kind of walked out there with my translator and had my translator relate to them that I'm just taking pictures uh, for nothing but uh, myself, my own enjoyment. And so, you know, I, I took several pictures of, of, of different people, but I thought this, this was an incredible picture. I was sitting from him, and he was basically, we take coffee breaks or a smoke break or whatever. Well, he was taking a smoke break, and... Uh, that he was going to go back to work, and uh, he offered me if I wanted, uh, you know, a hit from his uh, bong, and I, I chose to say no because I didn't exactly know what was in there or, or how my day would end. And, uh, but I just think, I just think that's a really cool photograph to me. I think taking portraits, I don't do a lot of portrait photography. I think you can, uh, you know, see the, the wear on someone. Um, you know, you can see the happiness sometimes in people's eyes or the sorrow. You can see the, uh, he's probably saying, okay, take my picture and get out of here. You know, uh, but uh, everybody that uh, I've ever had the opportunity to take pictures of, I've always asked, and uh, they've always been very gracious, and I think that's the one key thing. And if they say no, I can understand, and they don't want their picture taken. Uh, but Thailand and uh, uh, Vietnam, you know, uh, the Golden Corner or Golden Triangle uh, was a was a fun destination because I got to see a lot in a short period of time, and uh, uh, there's a lot to be photographed over there. This was a netter. Uh, this was a netter image that I took as I was walking down the street, and. Uh, black and white image, but it had a little bit of sepia tone to it, and uh, once again, I'm taking a picture of them, capturing it, uh, and they didn't miss a beat, you know, they were gracious enough to look up, and I asked if I could take their picture, and they said yes, and then I kept walking, and they went right back to eating, and, but to me, that, to me, that's a, uh, in my eyes, you know, it's one of my favorite photographs that I've taken in the last 15 years uh, of all my travels, especially of, of people photography. Uh, I really enjoy that photograph uh, because it, it shows the setting that they're in. And um, I don't know, I just think I captured the moment. This is a shrine. Um, in Kyoto, and I was just uh, I was just in Japan uh, earlier the year, and so Kyoto is the old old capital of Japan, and so uh, there's a lot of uh, wonderful shrines and temples down there, and a lot of a lot of things to photograph, and so this was one of the uh, actually 
learned about this through social media because other people had been going there and I just saw that it was trending and so I thought, well, I'd like to go there. So when I was in Kyoto with my translator, I asked him how far it was. It wasn't far. Um, and so, you know, there's hundreds of people that are doing the same thing that you're doing, taking pictures and seeing things for the first time. And so, you know, people say, well, how do you not get a picture of people in your photograph? Well, you have to kind of walk fast and get around corners really quick. I didn't use Photoshop or anything like that. There's people coming. There's people behind me walking, and there's people coming. You just kind of, you know, it's all about timing. You know, you might take 10 pictures, and you get one picture. Hopefully, the composition is good. And uh, I, I just thought the, uh, the picture was really interesting. Uh, the, the Japanese writing, I thought, was really ornate and cool. And then I asked my translator, who is also a sports uh, agent, uh, and he started laughing. And I go, what are you laughing about? And he goes, well, most people that don't read Japanese don't know what it says. And I go, yeah, I know. That's why I want to know what it says. And he goes, well, it's just a bunch of sponsors' names. You know, you know it's like you, we could all make a, you know, you make a donation here and, and uh, the Farmers uh, Museum and uh, the Fenimore uh, benefit from that. Uh, and so people will make a donation to these temples and shrines and for the upkeep and what have you. So this, this is somebody's name right here that made, you know, a donation. So now I knew that, and I wouldn't have known that. I just thought, uh, you know, the, the lettering uh, being ornate in the, uh, the, the Oriental-looking uh, lantern, and then the super bright, and the picture bright doesn't do it justice, but the super bright uh, uh, fluorescent orange paint uh, just really illuminated. It was pretty pretty awesome to see when the, uh, the sun was coming through the, uh, the telephone pole. They're not, not that big, but... Uh, really cool when the, the sun rays would come through the cracks. I'm sure you probably all recognize this. This is the Louvre in Paris. And so, um, I love going to places like this. I love going to Italy. I love going to uh, Paris. Uh, I love going to London. Uh, it's different. It's big. It gives you lots of opportunities, uh, different opportunities. I love my own backyard, Monument Valley, and, and all that area, but it's just a different setting, different landscape. Um, and so I was there a few years ago uh, before COVID. And uh, so obviously, you, know, you see pictures of the Louvre, and you know, everybody kind of takes the same shot. So I was trying to be a little creative. and. You know, there's always lots of people there, and I don't Photoshop. I just try to get the picture when there's nobody there, and it, there's people in the picture, which doesn't bother me as long as it's not too, too distracting. But I always try to find locations where I can where I can take a picture where there's not a lot of people at. It's a different angle. I don't mind crawling, getting on my stomach, taking a lower angle, getting high, some anything like that. It, it just lends to a different look of a photograph that that you may see it in a different light, uh, literally and, and uh, figuratively. Um, and so this was just taken in the, a big doorway. Uh, behind me was a, a narrow big open courtyard, uh, but I thought it was perfect timing. The, the, the sun was coming down before, uh, behind the lantern there, and uh, yeah, I just uh, enjoyed uh, taking the picture at the time because nobody was coming. You could see the cobblestone. And so once again, just trying to make, frame things, frame things in your viewfinder, and this was already kind of framed with the doorway there, and then the composition, and then sometimes doing the light edit to it, you know, straightening things out a little bit, and, you know, or what have you, but uh, that's kind of my thought process when uh, take, taking a lot of pictures. Having an idea where I want to go is the most important. Uh, I do my research just like I did when I was facing a baseball team in the hitters. I knew who was going to be in the lineup. I knew their strengths and weaknesses. It doesn't mean that I was going to be successful, but you got to go in being prepared. And I think if you go in, whether you're 
uh, doing photography or anything else, you got to have a little bit of preparation and be prepared what to expect and when do you want to go there, when, you know, sunrise, sunset, you know, what time of the year, and just have a little bit of a game plan. So anytime I ever travel anywhere, I always have a little bit of a game plan, knowing where I'm going to go and what time of the day I want to be there. So uh, I was happy with this photograph, and this was a photograph that I shared on my social media. Another photograph, this was uh, taken right below the Westminster Bridge. And a lot of times, I don't know how many people travel lately, but a lot of times when you go to these big iconic places, whether it's in Venice or uh, London uh, or uh, Paris uh, with uh, Notre Dame, uh, you really got to do your research because if you don't, you're going to be disappointed in if you go to London and recently, uh, I think it may be completed now, but for like three years, I think, uh, it been, and the whole parliament was under scaffolding, under reconstruction. And if you didn't know that, then you weren't going to get a picture. And it didn't matter how good your Photoshop person was, you were just going to have to put a whole new picture in. Uh, but I was able to get it. Uh, this was probably about, I don't know, about, about uh, eight or nine years ago, and uh, just walking around trying to find composition at a different angle, you know, and I thought, well, this kind of like the last picture I took, I used the doorway there for the, uh, for the Louvre, and this archway kind of lends to box everything in and frame everything really nicely, and uh, I think everybody looking at the picture, the last two pictures, you know, you read a little bit, and you know, you, you probably know that was the Louvre, and that's, you know, the Parliament and Big Ben. So, uh, those are pictures that I kind of, kind of enjoy taking. But once again, you know, it's not like taking a picture from Africa, you know, where an animal's here for one minute and then he's gone. You know, this, this kind of stuff isn't going anywhere. So, your opportunity isn't going to leave you, you know, the time of day uh, may always come back hopefully the next day and get your sunrise or sunset. So. This was um, uh, in Germany. And uh, I was in Germany about three or four, about three or four years ago uh, visiting, visiting a, uh, a, uh, heliqu- a helicopter squadron uh, of Blackhawks in Germany. And, uh, and so I had been doing a lot of USO work since uh, I retired, and it got to the point that a lot of times when we were going somewhere, they would ask if I wanted to, you know, they, they wanted to know what, what destination do you want to go to, and I'm sure there's a, a need in a lot of, of different places that maybe we haven't thought of, and so... Uh, I, I, I liked going to Germany. I'd never been to Germany before. And so this was uh, when the, the tour was over. Uh, we, I traveled with them so much that I would actually make arrangements that, you know, I would pick a destination that I want to go to and go visit after my USO uh, work is done. And I would do research and figure out where I want to go if I'm in the area that's not too far. So I hired a car, and it was a two-hour drive, and uh, I went to the Neuenstein Castle. And I might be pronouncing it wrong, but I think we all know what the Neuenstein Castle was built in the 20th century, I think, in Disneyland. Uh, as we know it, the castle Disneyland was built after this. And so a lot of people don't know that, and I didn't know it. And so you can see it, it was in the fall uh, with the colors of the trees. And um, I think uh, it was just a pretty cool picture with the, I think the trees make, make, make the picture quite a bit in the clouds. Uh, and so that was a, a fun visit to uh, capture something like that. And, and, uh, and then I had to go up to the castle and get a little bit of a, of a tour of the castle itself as well. This is in Venice, and so, you know, morning t- 
time, evening time, I think we all, as tourists, we, we all have a camera. We all want to kind of capture a certain picture that we all know is kind of iconic, if, if, if you will. But it's a matter of when do you want to take it in the morning or at night. And so um, I've only been to Venice once, and so this was, this was the area that I wanted to be in. Uh, because I've seen these pictures before there, you know, when, when something's trending and I'm looking at it, it seems to be redundant, then it just seems to be like every day I'm seeing the same thing, and then all, and then all of a sudden I wonder, well, do I want to take it because everybody's taking it, but if you take it, it's okay because you can be creative and you can take it your way, and, and that's what I'm saying about it's stagnant, it's staying there, so be creative, you got all day, you got all night. You can move around and take different angles and things like that, and, and uh, inevitably it will be a different picture, hopefully, than what you see all the time that someone else has taken. So, anyway, I, I just uh, enjoyed the moment being there, and, and uh, you, know, you put these all these travel pictures up on your in your house, and, and it brings back memories and moments of you know getting up uh, or staying up until midnight, you know. Um, to, to have areas empty out with tourists so you can get a better picture or whatever, or waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning and getting getting somewhere and thinking that you're going to be the first person there and you're about the 10th person waiting in line to take a picture. You know, so uh, you're not the only person that wants to take pictures. Everybody wants to take pictures and everybody is thinking in the same lines of getting there early and not having people in their pictures and getting the sunrise coming up or whatever. And, and so I enjoyed, uh, you know, this picture a lot. This is the miracle sort of it goes without uh, describing what it is. It's uh, the house that I was running a couple of months ago, and I had to move out because the house was starting to lean. Uh, but uh, the leading tower of people, uh, Obviously, and uh, I thought it was really cool turning it into, <laughs> turning it into black and white uh, and making it timeless. Um, and then I put a little bit of uh, blur vignette around it down at the bottom, and uh, and uh, you know everybody's taking that picture. You know, I even have a couple of pictures of it that I I think I have, or hopefully you don't. Know, but uh, I don't have that one on my wall. I don't have that one, so. Uh, um, this is, uh, this is, uh, Vernaza, Vernaza in Chicatera. Five small little villages, five small little villages all kind of connected. And you can take a small little public train and it's connected to all the little villages. And so, uh, you can kind of town hop, if you will. And all of the different villages are all, uh, got a lot of history and all on the, the waterfront, and so they all uh, have their own little feel. You know, the inlets are all a little different in how you uh, set up uh, the composition, but uh, this was one of my favorite uh, locations for, for a lot of reasons. Um, the destination itself, the food, I love Italian food. Uh, the people that I'm sitting on these, these big boulders right there. And uh, there was about a half a dozen other photographers waiting for the same shot. So I'm listening to them talk, and they're all speaking Italian. And I'm wondering if they're talking about me, about who is this big old tall, tall kid. Uh, but uh, then a couple of uh, other uh, people came and, and uh, started uh, taking a few pictures, and they were Americans. And so we uh, had some dialogue, but, uh, you know, without saying, Everybody enjoys taking pictures, whatever language you speak. And, you know, someone that speaks Italian is showing me his picture. I kind of give him a thumbs up, a universal thumbs up, and that makes him smile, you know. So um, it's one of my favorite pictures uh, in the evening. Another picture that, uh, 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 that I really enjoyed was uh, Italy. is one of my favorite destinations, uh, along with Africa. Uh, I think there's a, every day you can probably go out and, and photograph five, ten places and 
in Italy and you still wouldn't capture uh, everything. Um, but unlike anybody else with my camera, I'll wake up early and go to the hot spot. And obviously, it's always the Coliseum uh, or various places that are, are the, you know, all the uh, tourists will go to. So I woke up uh, about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, grabbed a cab and a cup of coffee, and just sat there. Stake. I literally just sat on the ground Indian style, had my camera set up on a tripod with a cable release using a Canon a digital camera, knew what I was waiting for. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get uh, the sunrise, uh, and this kind of comes into play because I've seen sunrises before with other people's uh, pictures of the same kind of setting, but it must be the different time of the year, which makes all the difference, but I still wouldn't still like the way uh, everything kind of lit up in the arches, all the, the, the uh, architecture was all lit up with the, uh, with the landscape light and, and uh, the cobblestone kind of leading into the picture. So that's a, a, another uh, a photograph that I, uh, that I like uh, in my travel. Another picture from Monument Valley when I was in the back country of Monument Valley with a local guy there. And if you just go as a, if you just go as a regular tourist, you're going to see the things that we saw earlier, but you're not going to see some of the hidden treasures because you would need to be with a local uh, Navajo guide, and he knows the area. And he's allowed to go in these uh, these areas, and so you know, we woke up really early in the morning, and uh, there was nobody out there. Just, just. Uh, just us photographing, and we just kind of walked aimlessly, and, you know, just where do you start taking pictures? You know, you just have your camera ready, and you start trying to think about, you know, composition, and what are you looking for, you know? You know, the fog, it was, it was really heavy in fog, and I thought that led to a lot of pictures and kind of eerie, but it's not a black and white picture, and you can understand why with the, uh, the red sand dunes there, and so uh, it was a uh, fun, it's a fun trip going up there because there's just so much to, to see there. And I think uh, for me, I just always try to be creative. I could go to the same place and, you know, I, I feel like when I come back from some place, I feel like I, I didn't capture everything that I wanted to capture. You know, I feel like I left something back there and, and my best pictures are still need to be taken. And that's why I keep going back to. Italy and going back to Africa because I feel like like I'm still searching for that perfect game. Well, I'm still searching for the perfect picture. So someday I might get it. So in, uh, not everything is all about uh, uh, taking pictures of pet concerts. Sometimes it's, a, it's kind of a h- harder process to to uh, to have it work out for, but. But uh, recently, I was just over in uh, Japan, and uh, I was with uh, my translator and a couple of friends of mine that uh, are big into music and have connections. And while I was there, they uh, they asked me if I wanted to go see Eric Clapton, and I think we all know who Eric Clapton is. Uh, and I said, uh, okay, sure, let's go. And uh, one of my favorite artists. So we went to the famous uh, venue called the Budokan, and uh, I don't know how old it is, but... Uh, you know, it's probably a couple hundred years old because it was used for uh, martial arts and, and things like that. And so, uh, maybe a hundred years old. Uh, and I walked in there for the first time, and I'd heard a lot about this venue, obviously, through through other American bands and English bands that recorded there. And uh, like Led Zeppelin is a, another famous band that's played there. And so when I was going in there, you know, I was expecting to see this really uh, ornate, which a lot of things in Japan are, uh, in top-notch stuff, you know, and I walked in, and then it looked like an old gym mat was on the floor in these fold-up plastic chairs, but man, when Eric Clapton came on, and you could hear him to the PA system, I wear an hearing aid, so I talk really loud. I don't know what happened to my hearing. Maybe it was uh, all the home runs that I gave up on, you know, all the, the impact noise. But uh, but I've never heard a better uh, sounding concert uh, at the Budokan. The 
this is uh, as we, uh, uh, Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick. He made uh, really famous uh, that five neck guitar. Uh, a lot of times, uh, a lot of times, shooting some of these bands, they're, they're sports fans. You know, it doesn't have to be baseball, but they know, you know, I'm a fan of theirs, and they can be uh, you know sports fans. So it's a good, a good. Uh, a good thing because a lot of times, you know, they give you a little bit more access, maybe, you know, hey, maybe you can go ahead and, and just don't knock anything over or unplug any cords, you know, and you can stay the whole show, you know, and uh, so a lot of times, you know, when I pick out some of my pictures, I'll send them to the people and they go, wow, these are really nice, so it hopefully leaves the door open for another opportunity down the road. This was one of my earliest pictures with that uh, that Mini Cooper that was in the dumpster. That was one of my, it was a college picture. This is a band called The Clash. They were kind of like a punk rock band that, that happened kind of slightly after uh, a band called The Sex Pistols, where they came from Great Britain. And so they were a band that warmed up for another band from uh, uh, England called The Who. And so I was in college, and I was working for the Daily Trojan, the college newspaper. And so uh, they asked me if I, I wanted to take pictures so they could, you know, write a review of the concert. And I said, sure, I'll go. So I got to take pictures of the Who in the class. And, you know, uh, they still have a few of these pictures left. Uh, like a lot of the pictures that I took in high school and college, a lot of them have vanished. And, uh, but ones that I still have, I'm very fortunate and happy that I have because it puts a big smile on my face when I, when I see this stuff that's 40, you know, 30 plus years old, and I look back and see this stuff and I go, wow, I wish I would have seen them more. I wish I would have had more pictures uh, to, to, to share and see. You all probably know who this band is. I became friends with them. I actually pitched in Houston for two months. And uh, I, uh, got to meet them, and they're, they're sports fans, and so whenever they came to Arizona, they would always allow me to photograph. That's uh, a, a lot of fun to, to, to shoot that band. This is uh, a really popular band in Seattle. It's a little band. Uh, they, they went off and did pretty good things, I guess. Uh, most of you might have heard them. They're called Pearl Jam. Yeah. Uh, that's Eddie Vedder. I became friends with him. And most of the Seattle bands I played in Seattle for 10 years. So when I wasn't pitching, you know, I went to a lot of these shows and a lot of them would come to the baseball games. I remember the first time that I met one of my good friends uh, in Seattle. He's a guitar player for a band called Soundgarden. I was sitting in the dugout in the kingdom watching the game, and then all of a sudden they put the picture of him. I didn't know him yet, but I recognized him. Uh, they put his picture uh, up on the Jumbotron, and so now I knew that he was a baseball fan, so I went uh, with a couple of clubhouse kids uh, the, the same year to a Soundgarden show that was locally, and we kind of weaseled our way backstage, and I talked to the general manager, and I, you know, I said, hey, I'm Randy Johnson. I, I play with the Seattle Mariners. Uh, you know, if Kim ever wants to come to a game and take some batting practice, and, uh, you know, then here's my number. You know, he called me within two or three days and goes, when can I take batting practice? And that was in the early 90s, and I talked to him as, as recently as three days ago, you know. And so uh, friendships come out of this, too. You know, it's not always, it's about the photographs, yes, but friendships come out of it, too. So, uh, and, uh, you know, recently I was uh, doing some marketing things, uh, some meet and greets in, in Arizona, and uh, Eddie Vedder played uh, a show there, and we got to see him, and we talked about some old Seattle days. Uh, Billy Joel, you probably all know Billy Joel. I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, have the opportunity to get all access. I don't know how that happened. Uh, uh, I just sometimes when you get all access, you don't say anything and you just kind of keep your head down and, and snap a lot of pictures. Uh, the 
first time I got the photograph, Billy Joel was up in Seattle, and uh, it was through great help through a, a marketing person up in Seattle that arranged that, and I got to meet Billy and and uh, photograph uh, photograph the show. And this was taken while I was on stage, and you can see all the all the the, the lighters out in the audience and the cell phones, uh, and so getting this kind of access is kind of unheard of. And, uh, you know, uh, so you don't want to mess it up. You know, you don't want to abuse it. You don't want to, you know, do anything that will um, will get you kicked out of there and never be able to go to a show again. Uh, a show again. And so, so for a lot of times, I just kind of take a few pictures and then I move on. I don't stay in the same area for if I may be being recognized on a camera or something like that. You know, you take a few pictures and get out of there. But some of these images, you know, this isn't how I grew up taking pictures at concerts, you know, when I was in college. I was down in the photo pit looking up at the artists, and those were the pictures. And then as time evolved, I realized through other photographers that I admired their work, the photos that I liked the best weren't the pictures from the photo pit. It was from the side of the stage, or it was from the back of the stage. It was what the artist was seeing, maybe the audience. You know, I think that lends some um, some credibility to um, being able to see what the artist is seeing. We already know what we're seeing, but now you can see what they're seeing. And so it's not always easy access. I mean, they don't give that kind of access out to everybody where you can just be up on stage, you know, especially someone that's six foot ten. So um, very fortunate. I, I got to do the that a couple of times, once in Seattle, and then when he came to uh, Arizona and played in the ballpark there, that was a great uh, thrill as well. We all know who uh, Elton John is. Um, unfortunately, uh, this, the sound garden picture that I was telling you about, or that was Pearl Jam, but the sound garden friend, the, the singer had passed, unfortunately, and so I went to his memorial service, and there was someone uh, later that evening, there was a there was a dinner in his, uh, at Chris Cornell's honor uh, put on by his family for, for family and friends. And so I was there, and, you know, I got to see some old Seattle friends that were there, but um, which was nice. We, you know, from a business perspective, someone came up and, and, uh, and uh, of all moments, kind of said, here's my business card. I work with Elton John. I, I see your pictures on social media, and if you ever want to, take photographs of Elton John, you know, give me a call, and I just kind of go, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, just like him calling me, wanting batting practice, I called this gentleman, and, you know, I was able to go to, uh, to Caesars uh, Casino, and when he was doing a residency, and we had a great time, uh, got to go to uh, two shows, one show. Uh, you know, I photographed in the other show. We just watched uh, the concert in the suite, and I felt like I missed something, though. I felt like I left some photographs. That's what sometimes you kick yourself when you've got all access. You know, I don't want to abuse it, but I don't want to feel like I didn't take advantage of it either. You know, an artist like Billy uh, uh, Elton John is no longer touring anymore, and when you have that opportunity to... Uh, to take photographs, you really want to maximize that and, and uh, hide up on stage if there's an opportunity because, you know, you don't get that kind of access. So uh, going through the pictures that I took, I felt like I was pretty happy between Billy Joel and Elton John. I mean, stars like that, you know, to be able to even take photographs and be asked to, you're, you're pretty lucky. So uh, the photographs that I've been able to take of these big, big musicians, I'm pretty fortunate. This is uh, in Yankee Stadium, out in center field. And this is a, 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 a friend of mine. He plays drum for a, a hard rock band called Anthrax, and they were playing with a band called Metallica. Uh, and uh, so they uh, they had a big festival in Yankee Stadium. And so, once again, I got all access. So you, know, you take the picture, and you kind of get out of the way. And, and uh, I like to say that I'm a six foot ten ninja. Uh, but we all know that I'm not. Uh, but you get your picture, and you know that uh, you're you're getting what you want. But 
you don't want to abuse the opportunity so you get out of the way and let people do what they got to do. This is a, a band called Black Sabbath. And this is Ozzy Osbourne, and Tony Iommi is a, a legendary guitar player. Um, and another band that uh, has retired. Uh, as we all get older, people retire, and so I feel fortunate that I've had the opportunity from two perspectives. I'm a fan of their music, listen to their music, but I also get to photograph them, and the music won't go away. The music's always going to be there, but the opportunity to photograph, in some cases, Elton John, Black Sabbath, you know, I don't do a lot of concert photography anymore, but the opportunities won't, don't even exist now, even if I had that opportunity. So you got to take advantage of the opportunity when it presents itself. And here's Ozzy right here telling everybody he's number one. And this is the, the main, uh, my main photograph in my exhibit that you'll see across the street. The, the photograph is almost about that size, too. And uh, hey, when you see your work on a wall, and, uh, you know, baseball was my life, and, you know, uh, I had a lot of passion for that, and I was, ex you know, when you get paid, you're expected to do well, so, uh, you know, it was a job to me, and I worked extremely hard at it, and so photography is not a job, it's a passion. And there's a big difference between the two. I had passion for baseball. I wanted to be great. I wanted to be good. But at the same time, it's a job. And there, there's things expected of you, you know, uh, leadership and, and, uh, and guidance. You're helping the other pitchers that are younger than you kind of take them under your wing and, and help them and, and show them the ropes. And, and uh, a lot of times it's more do as I do, not as I say kind of thing. Uh, and so, uh, I just think that, you know, that being a photographer now, and I should say now, but being immersed into photography now, I really enjoy it because I don't feel there's any expectations. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, you know, sell something. I'm not trying to impress anybody. I'm just trying to share my images with, uh, through social media, and that's really how this all started. And, and like you were saying, how it all began with Josh and Jane and Paul asking me if I wanted to share my photographs on a, on a larger stage. And so that's really all this has been about. And uh, to get the feedback that I've gotten, I'm pleasantly surprised that that many people really enjoy my work and, you know, the adversity that I have, uh, whether it's, you know, concerts or travel or, or animals. So uh, uh, in doing that, uh, you know, I think the one thing that I try to share is a lot of people, hopefully they'll go to Africa now or, or shed some light on something, you know, that maybe you didn't know much about. So, so the one thing that I, the one thing that, uh, you know, when I, when I was here for the opening of my exhibit, uh, the end of uh, March, March 31st, uh, the exhibit opened, uh, I did a really nice uh, sit-down interview with the MLB Network. And, uh, and they did a little uh, video of my work, and then uh, we did an interview. And so, basically, I think I've had 14 opening days. It was opening day uh, for Major League Baseball that day when my exhibit opened up. And so, uh, to try to tie in opening day, uh, I, I told them that, well, now if the club was in front of the leopard, this would be my 15th opening day. That was kind of the steer that I had on opening day uh, for 14 of them. But uh, you can see a little bit of like this there, I guess. And then just to show them put it in their perspective, how close it would be to a lion. And I don't know, you know, if she wanted her picture or if she just wanted to eat my leg. But uh, that's how close you can be. Just another example of, of a leopard up in a tree, and 
you know, a lot of times when you crop a picture, it can lend to a different look of the photograph as well. I like to tend to try not to uh, be too tight on the subject, whether it's a person or an animal. Uh, you know, unless that's what the final picture is going to look like, but you can do that by cropping the image uh, to a certain extent. But, uh, you know, this may have been a picture that was a little bit wider, and I thought it was a better photograph crop, but just another leopard picture that, uh, you know, getting the opportunity to see these, these wild animals in their environment in the wake, more importantly, a lot of times you see these animals and they're asleep and, you know, you've flown 24 hours and you want to wake them up and say, okay, we're here. Uh, but, uh, some do cooperate and some don't. This is the same picture. This is the same leopard. Not what we just saw, but this is my main focus uh, photograph on the, on the exhibit across the way. This is the picture that I have in my house uh, from head to tail. And the one that is the main feature across the street is a horizontal picture, if you remember. And it was a little bit tighter, a little bit more emphasis on his face. And I did that specifically so when you walked in, you would see the detail on, on the face and, uh, and not be so far away from the picture. I thought that lent to, to when you first walked in and uh, be a little bit more dynamic. And then obviously if, you, if, you have, if you're lucky enough and have the ability to be at the right place at the right time at the right time of the year, you can see uh, cubs or, or, or maybe anything really. Uh, but it, it, it's always about timing uh, over there. And so you know, that picture right there, uh, or that five minutes I might have had because it was early morning, it was probably uh, from here to uh, the drive was probably from where my camp was to the Baseball Hall of Fame, about a, maybe a 15-minute drive or so, 10-minute drive. But, you know, we got there, they were playing, and within five minutes, the mom kind of rounded them all up and they hid in the bushes. And so that's what I'm saying. It's all photography, you have to be uh, ready for anything. You, know, you, you have to be ready for the opportunity when it presents itself. And so this was an opportunity that I had, and I knew these were the pictures that I wanted. So I focused not on the bigger lines, but how often do you get to have pictures of cups and in, in a, in a, uh, have an opportunity because usually they're hidden away and you don't see them. So. And then you can see the difference between a black and white picture and when I, uh, from a color picture. Uh, I have one of my favorite line pictures and I haven't seen a lot of lines in my, in my travel, but I've seen enough to know that the picture that I have uh, across the street, I turned into black and white. I just thought it led to a uh, more dynamic picture, and then I colorized it. So the original, the original picture across the way is a black and white picture, and he's looking right at you, and uh, the eyes are colorized. So if you look at the picture and up over across the street in the gallery, you're almost waiting for the line to blink or to jump out of the picture. Uh, so uh, uh, that's one of my favorite uh, animal pictures that I've taken. And this is an amber sully uh, in Kenya. This is an animal refuge. Uh, you'll see a lot of other animals, but primarily there's watering holes, big marshes, and, uh, and you'll see these big bull elephants. Uh, that, uh, we don't see any here, but some of the biggest elephants that have the biggest tusks in the world, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of them will migrate here and be put here uh, because it's safer, because it's a national park. And, but somehow, unfortunately, poachers still get in there and uh, they will still kill the animals for their, for their hide or their, or their ivory. Uh, but this was a photograph that I've seen, and when I took it myself, I had seen it taken by uh, a great photographer. His name is by the name of Nick Brandt, and he does a lot of big a charitable work for, uh, for elephants, and so uh, I'm probably
probably maybe about 100 yards away, and these elephants start up in the mountains, and then they come down as a family in a group, and then they go to these big marshes, these big watering holes, and then you can get really close to them in the car when they go into these. I mean, you're, it's like where you're at, you're in a watering hole, and I'm right on the road, so you're literally like within touching distance almost of them. But here, when they come down out of the mountains, it's such a dry dust ball that all you see is dust. And the first time that I saw a big family of uh, elephants coming my way, all, all I saw was dust. And I asked my translator, what, what is that like a dust storm? He said, no elephants are coming our way because there's so many of them in here. They were on a different kind of land. But, but the... 20 or 30 or 40 elephants coming in, just like you just wait and it's dynamic and it's, uh, it's the greatest thing that I've ever witnessed in my life when it comes to animal photography because they're coming right at you and then all of a sudden you just kind of get your picture and the driver knows to get out of their way because you don't want to disrupt what their, their mission is and, and that's to go feed and eat. This was uh, taken in one of those watering holes that I was talking about. We're on dry land on a, on a dirt road, and I'm, I'm standing up on top of the car uh, to give a different perspective. And uh, it's just a herd of uh, zebras that are kind of migrating through, uh, through the waterfront there. And then a destination that I enjoy uh, is Ethiopia. I've only been there one time. Um, and tried to make the most out of it. And, uh, and in preparation of going to Africa again, I've been able to uh, find a, uh, a person that's Ethiopian, and he's a photographer as well, and he's a guide. So I have the perfect storm there. He knows the pictures that I want because he takes the same kind of pictures. And he can accommodate me because he's a local, he's Ethiopian, speaks the language, and everybody trusts him because he comes through the villages and, uh, and uh, you know, he does the same thing with all the people that, uh, that hire him. And so I'm really looking forward to hopefully some different opportunities that will present themselves and, and maybe give me some different photographs that I don't already have. And this, this kid kind of migrated to me. I just, I called him, I called him Stretch. Uh, and I'm six foot ten, as you, as you know, and, and he was probably maybe around six, 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 five. And I only have him by a few inches. Uh, and so uh, the one thing that I thought was the greatest is people are just super friendly there. And, uh, and uh, they probably have no idea. I mean, they're a little bit... Uh, Americanized with cell phones, and it's not like you're going into the dark over there, but, uh, but uh, obviously you, you leave a place like that appreciating what you have, what you're going home to, because sitting in a mud hut and having your your fire pit in, to keep warm in the floor of the ground where everybody sleeps is not what I would call, uh, you know, great in a mud hut, but it's what they've come to live. This was when I was leaving, and I thought it was, out of all the pictures I've taken, I thought it was one of the most impactful pictures. I was basically just saying goodbye, and all these kids, you know, I kind of interacted with them, took pictures of them, and, and said hi to them. And, and so I was leaving, and uh, just uh, basically saying goodbye, and my window was up, and I had my camera down, and I had my phone next to me, so the, the, the young boy up and not only did he wave, but he almost like put a, you know, his hand up against the window like saying, hey, it was fun. It was nice to meet you. And so it was really, to me as a photographer, I'm just a human, you know, coming in and being allowed to go into their uh, house for a little while and open up. But I just thought it was uh, something I've never really experienced before from, from that, uh, you know, from a different culture like that. And to, to have a picture like that probably outweighs any other picture that I took there because I think that's the most powerful picture that just happens. And like I'm saying, as a photographer, 
things present themselves and are you ready to capture the moment? My camera was down, but I had my iPhone in my hand, so I just took a picture. And that's not from a camera, you know, per se. It's from my iPhone, which is the best camera when you, if it's in your hand at the time. So I'd say that's probably one of the most impactful pictures I've ever taken. That's it. And I know it's really hot in here. I would like to thank all of you for coming, uh, all of you supporting galleries and the museums here, I think uh, that means a lot to the artists, uh, because that's where we get to, that's our outlet, where we get to share what we do with you, and uh, for me to have a turn up like this uh, and support my work, and, uh, and you guys give me the outlet to talk and share, uh, I thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate, uh, appreciate all that, thank you. so much, Randy. Um, now, I would like to invite you all to a reception in the space just outside this room. We have food and drink by the Brimstone Bakery in Sharon Springs, music by our own Rob Montecalvo. Randy will join us outside. Thanks again for coming, and thank you, Randy, for a wonderful